It's coming. It's coming? Yeah, I know. It's, uh, it works. Okay, so we're still waiting for uh, some participants. Um, hopefully, they would be able to uh, to get to their seats. Okay, so I hope you uh, you had a nice uh, evening and uh, you take rest uh, overnight. And uh, so we continue this morning with a, a session in which we have included. Well, I should have mentioned yesterday that uh, we tried to uh, structure the. Uh, um, the presentations uh, based on the, the contents, not only on these uh, four uh, themes that were in the, um, in the uh, uh, strategic research agenda. And uh, because some, so, some projects were kind of uh, covering more than one topic, and uh, so we tried to, to pack and, uh, by um, uh, uh, around some topic. In this one, we all, we had only uh, a limited number of projects on biocontrol, only two, and so we and we included uh, uh, um, a more a broader uh, project on uh, assessment of sustainability in the same uh, session. And um, so this morning it's uh, Astrid Villeneuve from uh, Switzerland. Foag, still Foag, yeah, yes. yeah, okay. And um, that would be uh, chairing this uh, session. And the rapporteur is. <coughs> So, hello everybody. Thank you for coming for this second day of CIPM uh, meeting. Um, as uh, Antoine already said, I'm Astrid Villeneuve from the Federal Office of Agriculture in Switzerland. And uh, now we will have the session three of Integrated Biocontrol and Sustainability. And I would like to uh, introduce uh, Stephen Kildea from Chagas to talk about the project EU RES. Floor is yours. So thank you very much. Uh, we're the project that's not biocontrol. Um, very much this fits in under the, the pesticide resistance and pesticide resistant management. I suppose also it probably takes the box of monitoring also. So uh, the project, I suppose, is looking at uh, fungicide sensitivity. We're specifically dealing with Zemoseptoria triticide because of septoria, which I'll get into in a second. But I suppose one of the aspects that we want to look at is incorporating it within that Euro wheat uh, platform that already exists as part of the Endure project. So the project is composed of uh, five partner countries with six partners within it. I suppose that they set out the, the question, and, and it's something that I, I, I get personally asked, well, even within my own institute, is, well, we're talking about fungicide resistance, but does this fit in with the, with the IPM aspect? And of course, if we look at the, the, the principles, the eight principles of IPM, resistant management, of course, sits within that. But trying to identify or sort of elaborating exactly why we should have it in there and why it's very important, the first thing I, I say is it's, a, it's, it's effect or it's, a, it's an, a sort of a, essential to ensuring the effectiveness of the, of the fungicides, the pesticides that we have. And I suppose that we can deal specifically with pesticides at this stage, but I, and then move into fungicides. Um, and why is it why is it that critical importance? And I suppose okay, you could argue that okay, ensuring the effectiveness means that okay, the the, the minimum amount of pesticides that are required will be applied. Um, but also it, it provides that sort of level of insurance that if the other measures that come before that in that type of triangle or of those principles, if they're not given that effective control for the grower, then actually there's a measure there that, okay, we can put it out and we know that it will work and it provides that sort of level of insurance for them. So it provides confidence to a certain extent that they can implement these different measures along the way. Um, and of course, then at the very end, it reduces that risk to crop loss, which is, is vital to them. And that's really what they're trying to do. So within the project, we're specifically focusing in on one specific pathogen. And this is Zemoseptoria triticae. It's uh, the cause of Septoria triticae blotch in wheat, winter wheat generally. It's, a, it's the most economically destructive disease currently on, on wheat crops in Western Europe. Uh, the example, OK, is on the, le on the left hand side of the screen, we have a, a flag leaf, the final leaf of a wheat crop. Um, you can see the head isn't even fully out of, it, of, it, of the sheet yet, but already we're starting to see disease there. So this is an untreated sort of scenario. This is a case where actually the head hasn't even hit on thesis. There's no grain being filled there, but already we're losing the capacity to fill those grains. So a farmer sees this, they know there's a serious problem. Um, why is it actually a problem then in, in terms of the, our ability to control it? Uh, we can look at that, that, that pyramid of IPM and say that we need to put preventative measures in there and, and sort of suppressive measures. So the, the case would be, okay, we should be using resistant varieties. 
Yes, the resistant varieties are increasing, the commercial varieties are definitely increasing. However, we, we have to look at what sort of uh, penalties are coming through with those varieties. So we have to evaluate them, we have to make sure that they're suitable. So if we move within Western Europe, we have other components, other diseases that may actually be linked with resistance, for example. There's always this aspect that there's a yield penalty associated with resistance. Um, but as we even move more western, we can look at other aspects such as sprouting, fusarium resistance, sort of, disease, or sort of diseases and physiological problems that will, will also come through potentially. So as we improve our resistance, definitely we are in improving that IPM aspect. But currently, unfortunately, to, for farmers at the farm level, they are currently reliant on fungicides. And when I say currently reliant, we're reliant on timely applications. Now, something that we, we can see within the project is that when we talk about timely applications, the timely application for a crop in Ireland is not necessarily the same as a timely application for a crop, say, in Denmark or in Sweden. So if we're, if we're reliant or if there are farmers are reliant on that, ensuring that they have the, the right knowledge about actually what fungicide actives they should be using and how to use them in terms of resistant management becomes vitally important. And unfortunately, we are in, entering into a scenario where actually the level of effectiveness of the current chemistries that we have are becoming less and less. So this in itself will start to put more pressure on those lower uh, sort of bars in terms of the IPM, those preventative measures, uh, as we lose that effectiveness. But in also losing that effectiveness, we lose that insurance that I mentioned at the very start and giving us confidence that we can use those IPM measures. So they do go hand in hand. And a case in point is where we're actually currently at in Ireland is that actually the, uh, an untreated crop looks very similar to a full STHI, which are, would be regarded as newer chemistries, which doesn't look too dissimilar to a full STHI in an azole when you even add in that mixture aspect. And really, it isn't only until you start throwing a lot of these chemistries at it that you can actually get adequate disease control. To a farmer, this is what they will see. This is what they currently do. This is what they're currently recommended. But it's actually what's underneath that surface is what's actually the question that we would have in terms of how effective these are and in terms of from a resistant management, where are we going in, in this sort of scenario? We, we expect to see new modes of action coming onto the market in the, in the, in the near future. Not necessarily, I should say, new, new modes of action. We see one new mode of action. We see new molecules within already existing modes of action. So understanding what's currently going on in the, in, in the population is going to be very, very important. If we can ensure that we have that measure of, and, and, and effectiveness in the chemistry that is there, that, as, as I say, allows us to do the other aspects that we want to do in terms of IPM. So within the project, basically, we had a very, I suppose, a, a simple sort of a setup. We wanted to utilize this Euroweek sort of platform that already exists, it's to a certain extent, specifically for that dissemination. It has got a good platform. There is already some level of fungicide sensitivity work going on there. And one, one, one thing I would like to emphasize here is that we're not re replicating work that's ongoing. And we, we know, and I'm involved, I'm involved in myself and all the other partners are involved in doing national testing for sensitivity. However, what we want to do is sort of complement that. One of the aspects that we do find is that as we sit amongst ourselves, generally in November, and um, we start discussing the results, what we find is that my results from Ireland might be slightly different than the results from Denmark. And the question is, is that laboratories? Is it the methodology, etc.? So the very first aspect that we want to do is make sure that some of the concepts that we are using, some of the methods that we're using are pretty much almost identical, or we're using a sort of a common approach. That common approach goes from the actual collection of those samples, the sample in the field. How do we sample those field trials, for example, through to actually having a, a, a certain number of samples tested um, within one laboratory? and actually then comparing that with then some of the, the, the molecular data that everybody is generally generating at the moment. So the sensitivity and trying to link that in a common approach to the, the, this, the, the molecular data. Of course, the airborne inoculum, we know that airborne inoculum is very important within the Xenoceptoria population. Can we utilize that to give us an idea of where the mutations that we know, what we can link with the sensitivity, where they are, where they are at this stage in the population? Um, one of the other aspects is that, okay, I can, we, can, we can talk about Ireland as being out on the edge in terms of where we are in efficacy, but if, actually if we have a common type field of trial across the various partners, can we utilise the diversity and resistance that does exist, and we, I should say that we know exists already within that population, going from west to east, to try and identify or try and predict, okay, where things will be in a number of years for, for Denmark based on what's happening in Ireland, or will actually, is there any sort of a common approach there? So we have a common set of field trials. Um, and then finally, it's actually looking at the populations themselves. So 
are they emerging resistance independently of each other, or is it a westwards drive of population, or is it an eastwards drive of the population? To try and actually give us an idea if, if, the, if there is a sort of a population structure potentially going on there in terms of resistance, is there a means then that we could potentially manage it? So as I say, this is building on the, on the platform that already exists. We're trying to utilise that. And even within this, there is already some work that has been commissioned by the companies. So it's a, it's a platform that does exist, I suppose. Um, from a, from a, an agronomist point of view, it probably doesn't, it isn't getting the, the, the force that maybe other platforms such as Euroblight would actually get. So we're, we're looking at this as using it as a, a base for putting this data that we're gathering, putting the methodologies, the concepts, etc., basically up there and trying to, I suppose, advertise this as a source of actually where we are in terms of sensitivity. As I say, the national sensitivities, we're not replicating that. The resources are clearly not available to do that. Um, so actually what we're trying to do is just to supplement it, to use that as a base to actually try and link those national sensitivities that are ongoing. And this is actually just an example of where we are at, or where actually that platform is currently at, and this is the ASOL campaign that has been ongoing. So what they have within the platform is a specific mutation, it's similar to what uh, DDA presented in terms of the population throughout Europe, except we have a, a, a pie chart here that represents one field. Um, and under, within that, then, you can look at the different mutations. And this is data that the, the national groups would have put up until about 2015, and then we had a campaign with the ASOLs. Um, but here you can see, for one mutation, you can see that in Western Europe, we have a higher proportion of it than in Eastern Europe. So what the question then, of course, is to, from an agronomist or even from, an, uh, from a researcher is, what does this actually mean, and can we actually utilise this? So what do, do, what do these mutations mean? We have, we have some idea that actually, okay, this mutation is probably at the, the higher end, driving some level of azole resistance. Um, but what is all? Um, and then what about those STHIs? What about the QOIs? So we've, we, we're only sort of scratching that surface to a certain extent at, at the moment. So what does this sensitivity mean? And actually then, clearly we have this sort of a divide within, within Europe. And this was okay. This was in, in, in 20, I think 2015. We've moved on to 2018 and there's a lot more of these reds in, in Ireland and the UK and, and Western Europe. So it's actually, what, the, what does this mean? Okay, and, and we don't have all the countries in this project, but what we have is, We've got a diversity within the, the partner countries that we have to actually do that. <coughs> so clearly, in terms of sensitivity, what, what does that mean? And this is some of the, some of the work is that common sort of sampling across those partner countries too. We aim to do it at two sites. It is a very, very small sample to a certain extent, but it does actually give us that diversity. So this is just pulling out one of, those, one of the sites and we look at an SDHI uh, uh, and AS, or two ASOLs. And we look at two different sites, and we're looking at EC50 values. Clearly, you can see, even within Ireland, we have two fields that are completely different in terms of their sensitivity to the SDHIs. Maybe not to this ASOL, but then we've got a difference to the other ASOL. So there is even diversity within that national collection. But I, I would ask, when I look at these box plots, I clearly understand what's going on. And this is something that we then have sort of a, a conflict with, and that if we put these up onto the EuroWeek platform and, and, and talk to advisors, uh, the advisors straight away ask, what are you talking about here? So we, we are actually trying to actually look at how do we present this in a format that is actually of use to advisors. It's a question that we haven't yet got the answer for. We've got some of the data now that we can, we can feed into that and try and design that. Um, but it is something that we would like to do within, within the project is to, to try and present this in a, a format that is of use. This is sensitivity. The question then means what does it really mean in terms of field efficacy? And that's where... Uh, I should say, I've, I've jumped maybe, the uh, question me in terms of field efficacy, and that's, that's another question. But also within the, the monitoring, we have that airborne inoculum, and this is just some of the airborne inoculum that has come from Sweden in, in 2017, two sites, spore trap running in, in, in autumn. Um, and what you can see is that there is quite a lot of spores being released, uh, specifically in Sweden. Again, we have these two mutations, we have an idea of the sensitivity, the red has been S5214, the SIP51. Is generally cause for more, more resistance. Yes, it is present in the population, definitely present, but a majority of it do look green. They look like the wild type. They don't have that mutation there. However, this is, this is 2017. Um, how predictable is, or how can we use this going forward? When we get into 2018, um, I'm sure there's some here from Sweden that will confirm that actually there was no disease in, in Sweden uh, last year. So how important was this in terms of the epidemiology of the pathogen? Maybe not so much in terms of being able to predict the level of disease that occurred, but actually what we can say is that if it had occurred, 
we would have a proportion of the population definitely here that would have had showed uh, reduced sensitivity or some level of resistance to the azol fungicides. And that's even before we'd, we'd sampled the population. So looking at specific mutations, we do get that, that uh, aspect. We do get some information. And then adding that into the airborne inoculum. So the, the question then, okay, it gets back to, okay, how can we use this information in terms of the levels of efficacy that we're, we're currently seeing? And I think quite the thing is that, okay, throughout the, the partner countries, we move from the west to the east. We move from probably a, a very high levels of resistance to quite low levels of resistance, emerging sort of stage of resistance. So it's about utilising that diversity, to capture that diversity, and asking some very specific questions maybe within a common field trial. So we set up a, a field trial in, in 2017, 2018, and we've got the 2019 trial set up. In 2017, we specifically looked at one variety. We said we're just looking specifically for septoria on one variety, um, so choose a moderately susceptible. In 2018, we added the question of varietal resistance. Is there an interaction between varietal resistance and the, and the fungicide applications? In terms of the, common, the, the field trials, we broke it into two, or I should say maybe three components. So we had a common list of treatments, at the very start, they were a, a, a straight azole, an azole SDHI mixture, and then adding on into the, the multi-site. But we also asked the question, OK, if we apply these protectively, are they different than if we apply them curatively? So currently, we apply, or we aim to apply protectively, because uh, to a certain extent, we, we might think that actually protection is better for resistant management. But al also, uh, Xenoseptoria is latent period maybe between two to three weeks. So actually, knowing what, you, what sort of a, a amount of disease you might have in those upper leaves now does not mean actually in two weeks' time that that's going to be the same level and the infection has occurred as you were standing in that field. So generally, the programs will be applied protectively. But is there a difference between protective and curative? And this actually then came through into the national trials because we asked basically the partners, let's do three basic programs that actually would be representative of your I suppose, commercial treatments, what farmers are actually doing. So we went from a scenario where actually there would be four applications in Ireland to actually two applications in Sweden. Four applications starting at before growth stage 31 in Ireland and, and ending at growth stage 65, very much almost prophylactic in timing that these get on as that leaf is fully emerged, to a point in Sweden where actually it is growth stage 39, maybe growth stage 55, something I wouldn't even dream of recommending to an Irish farmer. So it actually gives us that comparison, the diversity that's in the population, but also the comparisons that actually the, the programs are also building. So we've looked at yield, we, we've looked at disease, we've looked at yield, and we're currently then looking at the sensitivity. So from every trial, we, we aim to sample uh, the, the sensitivity. Very easy from these common treatments because it was a single application. Some of them would have been be protectively and a lot of them curative. So it's very easy to get samples here. But the aim of these was not actually to get disease to a certain extent. So we're aiming to do what the farmer was doing. So we've, we've got disease, but it is generally low down. So we've been successful to a certain extent here in terms of doing that. So uh, as I say, where are we at? Yeah, 2017 was a perfect year for trials. We, as I say, we got lots of disease. 2018 was bone dry, and I think we, we got disease from Belgium um, and from an irrigated trial in, in Denmark, and we struggled to get disease in Ireland. As far as I know in Sweden, they didn't even get one lesion within, within the trials. So the difference, of course, is the weather. Um, but can you predict that weather sufficiently enough in with a latent period that is about three weeks long? Um, and that is a problem. There are most definitely indications of loss of efficacy. And it clearly comes back to where we are in the, the West, where actually, look, we have a population that is very, very resistant. Um, and we could see clearly that the ASOs are not effective. The STHIs are, have lost lots of effectiveness. And it's only when we actually get into that real national program where we're actually applying that multi-site with the ASL, with the STHI, quite a lot that we get that. But there are also indications of loss of efficacy throughout the, 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 the partners, especially when we start looking at curativity and looking at those solo ASL and with the STHI. Of course, but site of, is always going to be that biggest factor. But it's actually trying to understand how that population is interacting at those sites and what's driving that is, is, is what's important. So then finally, it's actually trying to understand that, uh, what's actually happening. So there is, we can look at the mutations and we can look at the individual gene and we can see, okay, there is potentially move more, move more, uh, movement uh, eastwards. But however, when we look at then the sensitivity of the population and we then look at different mutations, it might be an indication that actually there may be a bit more of a divide in the, in the West. It doesn't necessarily, it's sort of uh, the population here sort of s sits out by itself. Yes, it's got high levels of this mutation, but another mutation that would be very common over here, it wouldn't necessarily have. So the question is, is it moving eastwards? 
or is it actually a de novo mutations emerging? So the, it's actually emerging on multiple occasions, and actually this then does feed through to how we manage potentially this strategy. It's an airborne pathogen. We expect that it'll be moving around, but is the, the emergence over here uh, and over here and independently more of a driver than actually it's spreading? So that's a question that we are trying to look at. We're using current and past populations, um, and we're looking at setting up about 1,000 isolates. Basically, it's a, it's a number that I suppose economics have driven what we can actually do in this, but using a high pack assay with packed bio sequencing. To give an idea of where it is, so we're, we're selecting strains, but then it's a, it's a pool PCR with various different products actually going into it. So um, we're, lo we're looking at, of course, we're interested in fungicide resistance, so we're looking at the target sites. So we're amplifying the CYP51, the SDHIs, this, uh, the mitochondrial genes, but also then a range of housekeeping genes that we can look at from population analysis. To date, actually, we've been looking at it to try and set up this assay, and it is a, um, a preliminary study has been started. I, I know that they got the data a couple of weeks ago, and I'm pretty sure they're, they're crunching it at the moment. But we took two contrasting sort of populations from 2017, uh, 48 ISIS, half from Ireland, half from Denmark, where we know actually there's a, a completely different, completely different sensitivity profile. We know what the mutations are in the gene, um, and actually to see are, are they different, or actually is those, or, or have those sort of uh, mutations and genes moved across from Ireland over to Denmark. There are some that would have would be common between both. So that's, that question exists there. A lot of these isolates are also going for whole genome sequencing to see actually is it do we actually need to get more depth, or is it actually this assay going to be sufficient to provide um, the detail that we want? We expect that the, we will get the detail what we want, looking at the target sites and the genes, but including then a, a range of different housekeeping genes on it. In terms of the select selection of the strains, we've decided that actually we're going to use all those pre-treated samples. So all the samples that come in for that monitoring in 2018, we're specifically using those. We have a, a large range of diversity. We know that we have some very, very high outliers from Ireland, for example, and then some, some more sensitive uh, population in, in terms of Sweden and Denmark, uh, with Belgium and Germany probably in between. Um, but we do have a commonality. There's those mutations that are there. They may not be there in the same sort of uh, variant. They may not be in the same combination, but they do exist throughout the populations. So we're then actually asking, okay, can we see some selection going on, specifically when we apply treatments? Uh, do we see specific selection there? So we're using core, so three of those core treatments from the 2017 population. We're using some of those that are coming from those field trials. So they're very, very specific. We're using the non-treated and ASL and the STHI. To see actually, are we then selecting? We can clearly see phenotypically that we do some level of selection, especially when the mutations are there. But this, does this then affect the wider in terms of selection, the mutations across the countries? And then, of course, we are looking for additional populations because, okay, we have a lot of the diversity within the, the partner countries, but there is a lot more diversity out there in Europe. So, as I say, we're at the stage of the preliminary analysis. We anticipate that we will be probably starting the, 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 the wider collection in, in the new year. Then the question, okay, so well, how do we make sure that this information yeah, is, uh, how do we make sure that this information that we're gathering is actually of usage? Um, and I suppose, okay, we're, we talk about that Eurowheat platform, but unless we're actually really doing this, and this is what is going to be key, and this is what uh, we talk about, and we can talk that actually it's farmers that we need to be talking to. Realistically, we probably need to be talking to the agronomists. We need to be talking to the merchants. We need to be getting it clear to them that actually there are problems there. You scratch the surface, there clearly are problems. Now, we might say that, and, and, and the group here is the, is, the, is the project group, we might say that, okay, this is a problem for Ireland, but clearly we can start to see this moving eastwards. And what is the solution for, for Ireland is probably going to be, to a certain extent, the solution elsewhere. So actually, we need to make sure that actually the, the, it's coordinated effort that actually a lot of the sensitivity, as I said, there is a lot of sensitivity data out there, there's a lot of efficacy data out there. But as I said at the very, very start, making sure that actually they're all linked up, that actually there's a commonality between them is very, very important. And we see that actually we could hopefully do that with on the Eurowheat platform. But as I say, again, I'll get back to actually making sure that we are in these fields, and sort of identifying that actually the problem exists, so that actually we need to make sure that the people that are giving the advice are actually aware that that problem exists so that they can make sure that their advice is, is tailored to ensure that minimal selection is occurring, minimum management or better best management there is important. And this will in itself feed through to the IPM because if they do see this as a problem, and clearly we can start to see this in Ireland as, as a problem if you, if you move one of those three components from that programme. And this 
will drive, it has to drive change in terms of that preventative measures from the start, whether that is sowing later, sowing a different crop uh, per se, in terms of barley, which has its own problems, I should say. Um, but all those will start to feed through. So finally, just then to acknowledge the whole group, as you can see, there's quite a lot of us involved um, um, across, across the board, and of course, then the funders also. So thank you very much. So thank you. We have time for a few questions, a few quick questions. Yes? Do we have micro ready for a... Um, thank you very much. It's very, very interesting and I think a very, very important work you're doing here. I'm not so much uh, into the science uh, in this area, but my question is, I have actually two. The first question is, do you have any um, idea about the wheat varieties from where the different strains derive so that you could have a look if there is any connection to specific varieties? Or is it not important in this context? And the next question, do you take samples if somebody, because we know people in our country, for example, which might be interested to be connected somehow? Yep. Uh, so yeah. can so, we? So the, the answer to the second question. This would be something here yeah. in the audience also, maybe there are stakeholders which could give more contact to. Yeah. Because I think this is really something important for, this, yeah. for the next years. Yeah. Yeah, no, most definitely we'd be willing to take to some level of, of samples. As I say, it, it, it is a quite a, a large piece of work that is required, but definitely there is scope to take some level of samples. And I suppose also what we would say is that if there is data even available in terms of mutation analysis, that that can be fed through into the, into the Eurowheat platform already. So some of the data that is there is coming from Pacific projects. Some of it then is just coming from currently national testing that everybody is doing. But the, of course, the more information that we can get, the better. In terms of the first question, most definitely variety is probably having some impact. Now, um, within the project, we, we asked the question about varietal resistance and having comparisons within the national um, sort of population. Because we're sort of hoping, or not hoping, we're sort of leading this to some level to an extension component, being able to stand in a field with agronomists standing around a trial, we didn't sort of impose a specific variety nationally across every, every country, or we didn't impose specific varieties across every country to try and identify what's their differences there. But if you plant one variety, potentially it will pull one population. Um, but the pathogen itself is so sexually active that chances are it may break that up. But there is some evidence that you will get varietal selection for Iceland. I have one question. Thanks for your talk. It was very, very interesting. Uh, you've been talking about uh, protective and curative treatments. Is there the possibility for early disease detection and site-specific management strategies so that you're not treating the whole field? Um, I'd like to think so. But from a practical point of view, currently as it is, no. It is, it, it's so, so present. It's, it's pretty much ubiquitous. Yeah, but, but in the coming maybe 10 so years? In, in the coming 10 years, um, it, it is difficult to see. It is difficult to see. Okay, from the point of view maybe of uh, the Nordic countries where they maybe have lower levels of disease in the winter months, uh, you mightn't see much disease, I suppose, uh, until maybe uh, April or May. It might be a possibility there. But I can go into a field in Ireland now and I can already see the disease. So the question would be that should we apply a treatment now? We know that it actually that's completely uneconomical, unsustainable. It provides no benefit. And it's only later in the season where actually the disease is hampering yield that we should be treating against. So even in the, the countries where you might not see disease late on until late, in, late enough in the season, it's only until the point where actually that's causing an economic impact that it should be treated. Thank you. So now we have to move on to the next uh, talk. Um, there will be more time during the coffee break to discuss, so keep your question for uh, the, the coffee break. So now I'm inviting Mera Einkind from the University of Amsterdam to talk about the project DEFDEF. Good morning, everybody. 
Uh, I will represent Marai Kang. My name is Ima Torres. Uh, well. uh, I will present our project uh, titled Defense uh, less defenses that does biological control work better on unprotected plants. <laughs> okay, European restriction on the use of pesticides to protect the environment and human health have led to the, necess the necessity of implementation of alternative control measures that can control pests in an environmentally responsible way. Uh, this control measure uh, include biological pest control, uh, plant-resistant breeding, biostimulation, and green pesticides. Sorry. <laughs> uh, combining these approaches seem to be the solution to the demand uh, for pesticide feed production strategies. However, these strategies may interfere with each other. This is the case of biological pest control and plant resistant breeding. There is a conflict emerging when combining these two strategies. Since plant resistant taste may hinder biological control agents as, as well they hinder herbivores. So integrating these two practices can lead to two scenarios. In the first scenario, uh, the total effect of, of combining these two uh, strategies would be uh, partially addictive. In this case, grower may observe biocontrol uh, to fail that these natural enemies uh, are not established and may lose confidence in biocontrol. In the second scenario, the, new, uh, the effect of the new resistant trait on the river is uh, small, but this uh, new trait can inhibit uh, biocontrol. In this case, uh, the total effect of combining these two practices would be uh, worse uh, than the single effect and this uh, may make uh, growers uh, more skeptical of biocontrol and this can provoke the, provoke the use of illegal pesticides. Uh, well, um, we know that plant defenses can affect natural enemies in different ways. There are direct effects, including trichomes, that can increase natural enemy mortality and decrease their forage efficiency and phytotoxin that are injected uh, by the prey and can affect natural enemy that feed on it. On the other hand, we have indirect effects uh, because plant defenses can decrease prey quality and can affect uh, the abundance, the size and the nutritional quality of the prey. This effect of plant defenses on pests and their natural enemies can be modeled by adapting parameters in original predator-prey models. The prediction is uh, that the exposure of pests and natural enemies uh, to plant defenses may hamper biological control. This occurs when defenses increase mortality of natural enemies or when defenses decrease the prey quality. So the equilibrium pest density will go up when traits related to the predator as uh, mortality increase or when other traits uh, related to the predator as consume rate, operation rate, and conversion rate decrease. <coughs> so the main objective of this project is to assess to what extent chemical plant defenses interfe interfere with biological pest control to validate theoretical prediction with empirical data in order to determine, determine how we can <coughs> maximize the level of crop protection. Uh, to reach this objective, we may use of model organisms, uh, that is tomato, spider mice, tetranicus urtica, and predatory mice, phytocellulus persimilis. Uh, well, to test our working hypothesis that poses that plant lacking resistance might be more suitable for biocontrol, uh, we started uh, working 
eh, selecting a tomato defense muta, def1. This uh, muta uh, in, is no, can, uh, uh, can to not produce uh, anti herbivore defenses that are regulated by the hormone jasmonic acid. Uh, so uh, we determine deter we determine population growth of these spider mites and predatory mites on tomato the uh, def one mutant and on castle marplan that is the wild type of uh, def one with the genetic background. Uh, well, uh, to determine this population growth of a spider mite, we, in, we infected uh, this plant, uh, the wild type Castlemar and the deaf one mutant, with a fixed number of spider mites, and we uh, evaluated this population growth in the absence and in the presence of predatory mites uh, uh, through two months in a greenhouse setting. We used two spider mites uh, strains to infect this plant. Uh, one strain was reared on Castlemar plant, and therefore was adapted to normal tomato defenses, and the other strain was, def uh, was a reared on deaf one mutant, and therefore maladapted to normal tomato defenses. Uh, well, uh, population growth of spider mites and predatory mites were then uh, evaluated in a serial of experimental treatment depending on plant genotype, Castlemar or Def1, Tetranicus urtica reading on Castlemar and therefore adapted to normal tomato defense or reading on Def1 and therefore maladapted to tomato defenses and depending on the presence or absence of predators. Where these dynamics, predator prey dynamics, uh, were uh, followed by recording the number of mobile spider mite stages and the number of mobile predator stages, sampling a uh, leaflet uh, that were taken from the plants uh, twice a week uh, through two months. Uh, where we, are, we have the result for the population growth of Tetranicus urtica, we represented uh, the cumulative uh, number of mobile spider mite stages at each sampling date through these two months, and result uh, indicated that on Castlemar plants, the cumulative number of mobile Tetranicus urtica stages at the last sampling date uh, between treatment with, uh, without predator and with predator uh, only significantly differ on plant infected uh, with spider mites adapted to tomato defenses. Whereas uh, as, uh, when this plant with Castlemar plant were infected with spider mites maladapted to tomato defenses, this spider mite didn't successfully establish on Castlemar plants and we observed that this population were low through the experiment. Regarding the F1 plants, <coughs> uh, we observed that differences in the cumulative number of mobile tetranicu urtica stages at the last sampling date in treatment in the present and in the ascent of predator uh, were only significant different in those plants uh, uh, infected with maladapted spider mites. <coughs> On the other hand, when this Def1 plant were infected with adapted spider mite, we observed the highest cumulative number of spider mites at the last sampling date, independently of the presence or absence of predators. Where uh, the result indicated that Tetranicu urtica population were officially controlled on Castlemar plant and Def1 plant, but uh, when this plant were infected with the spider mites adapted to feeding on their respective plant genotypes. Uh, here we have the result for the population growth of Sphytoseurus persimilis, and the result uh, showed that uh, the cumulative number of uh, predator stages per leaf at the last sampling date uh, was higher on Def1 plant than on Castlemar plant, and in turn, on Def1 plant infected with maladapted spider mites. So, summing up, 
In the two treatments in which we observed that uh, the tetanicum urticae were efficiently controlled on castle marplan infected with adapted spider mite and, and, and on the one plant uh, infected with maladapted spider mite, the population of a uh, predator reached a uh, what higher on the one plant. At the end of the experiment, uh, we carried out a destructive sampling in which we counted the total number of a a spider mite female and um, mobile predator in the stages uh, on each plant per leaflet. And when we compare, um, because we, we wanted to have an estimation of the outcome of the predator prey dynamics. And when we compare uh, the two treatments in which we have a, we have a efficiently control of spider mites, uh, in the ascent of predator, we observe that uh, the final abundance of spider mite female on the F1 plants uh, was not significantly different uh, from that of castle mar plant. But in the presence of predator, this final abundance was lower on the F1 plant than on castle mar plants. Therefore, a spider mite population were finally better control of the F1 plants infected with maladapted spider mites. Uh, regarding predators, we observe that the population, uh, the final abundance of these spider, uh, these uh, predatory mites at the end of the experiment were low, uh, as well as population of uh, Tetranicus urtique uh, de uh, declined too. But we observe that in the case of the treatment uh, in which uh, the one plant were infected with adapted uh, spider mite, population of predator uh, were high at the end of the experiment, as well as population of spider mite. If these uh, predatory mice are able, uh, are, sorry, are able to, to control uh, these spider mites, should be evaluate, evaluated uh, uh, in the longer term. Well, with this, uh, uh, with this result, we can conclude that predators were capable of reducing a spider mite population on both Castlemar and Def1 plants, infected with the spider mite strain adapted to feeding on their respective plant genotype. However, at the end of the experiment, this final abundance of spider mite female was lower on the F1 plants, probably due to a stronger numerical response of predator on plants lacking defenses over normally defended plants. This higher population of the F1 plant um, might be explained either by a higher efficiency, efficiency of this predator converting prey into eggs or lower mortality of predator on the F1 tomato plants. The first uh, good suggests that the quality of the prey may be higher when removing plant resistant trays, and the second good suggests that the ascent of toxic secondary plant metabolite could increase predator survival. At that point, it worth it to mention that in a F1 greenhouse, the resident population will most likely be maladapted to normal tomato defenses. Well, uh, with the result obtained in this uh, project until now, uh, we think that it's essential to make the seed breeder and the biocontrol sector aware that aligning their product may lead to superior pest control, provided this is done carefully. And we aim at bringing together seed breeder and biocontrol company with the purpose to align their strategic agendas for developing new products that can ensure a consistent, consistent level of crop protection. Uh, well, finally, I would like to, to thank people who is involved in this project. They are from, th from the three countries. They are from the Netherlands from Belgium and from Spain. Thank you.
thank you very much. So we have the time for one or two questions. So who has a first question? No question? So I think we can, um, we can ask for the next speaker to come. If some questions are coming uh, during the presentation, please do not hesitate to come to um, Mar Marta, sorry, what? Imma. Imma, for uh, asking her some question about her project. So now, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm calling uh, Aude à la Philippe for the next presentation about Happy Tree. Thank you. So do not hesitate to remind me the time. Yes, I will. <laughs> yeah, and thank you. <laughs> so you have to move forward and up for the uh, red. OK. So it's good. We have already the nice smell of the cake for the break. So please be <laughs> concentrate a bit. I'm going to speak about fruit production. Uh, so good morning, everybody. My name is Oda La Philippe. Sorry, the light is always on. I will try not to play too much with it. Uh, so I'm the Happy Tree Project Coordinator, and this project aims at developing apple pest control strategies through an integrated agroecosystem approach. So the project started a year ago. We just had our annual meeting, so it's a bit too short to give you the first results we have. So I'm going to give you an overview of what is ongoing in the project and how we are working together. Um, okay, that's where, in which direction I have to point it. Yes, so first I wanted to start with the uh, list of participants because it's also really important for the way we organize the project. So we are represented five uh, countries, from Sweden to Spain with eight um, partners. Uh, here's the list. I'm not giving. I'm not going to give all the names. And the interesting aspect is that we really wanted to work uh, with this pedoclimatic gradient, and uh, so to uh, benefit from this uh, partnership we have made. And you are going to see how. In the other way. <laughs> so just some words about the context. Um, apple trees account for 35 percent of the European orchards. Apple uh, production relies on heavy use of pesticide. Just a word for the treatment frequency index, it's about 35, mean value, and it goes up, can go up. It relies on heavy use of pesticide because it's perennial. So if you have a problem a year, it will have consequence on the next years. And it could be for the whole cycle of your orchard. And also because we have, I forget an important word, we have a huge uh, pest complex. Here, a list of five pests. That's the one we are working on, but it's far to represent the whole pest complex. So I'm going just to mention that we are working on aphids and mostly on the rosy apple aphids, all of us, in this project. Uh, since for the conventional uh, um, production systems, there will be soon withdrawal of the last chemicals efficient against it. And it will be really, really problematic. And uh, in organic production, the countries using neem oil or neem azal are still safe, but it might be also soon withdrawn. So after that, we have no solution against it, and it can really destroy the whole production. Uh, I mentioned also those two, apple blossom we will and the European apple so fly. They are not considered as major pests, but in a strategy where you really decrease the use of a pesticide, it can be really problematic uh, since uh, there are no means to fight against them. So those secondary pests can become really important. The objective of our project is to design a combinations, combinations with a plural of practices that are alternative to pesticides to control apple pests. So we are working on pesticide, pesticide or I should say, insect, insecticide-free strategy. And we also uh, will assess the efficiency and sustainability of this solution. OK, just here, a um, view of the project organization. So um, I think the where we really wanted to work 
uh, and I will focus on work package two and work package three. We work on the design of system with lever combinations and orchard co-design. I'm going to develop what we mean by co-designing orchard. Uh, this uh, work package is really linked, so everybody's involved on those three work package. And here you will see it will work differently. Here we already have identified the lack of knowledge that are worked in the work package three where we work here on a simple uh, single pest and single lever or combination of levers to control those single pests. Uh, once we get this knowledge, we also uh, provide this knowledge to work package two in order to, impro to improve the strategy of co-design. Then work package one and work package, uh, work package one is more on the methodological aspect. Um, just to um, organize the sharing of protocols to develop the framework for co-design. And work package four is dedicated to sustainability assessment. Okay, so I'm going to th go through the work package just to show you how they, they interact together and how we are building the knowledge in order to go to an agroecosystem approach for integrated production. And I'm not speaking here about IPM, and you will see also why. Um, so, the first ta task we had within while where we were building the project was to define this conceptual framework. So, you have it also in the booklet <laughs> with the detailed uh, text. Just here, the idea was to put all together all the type of levers that are non-chemical levers that we can use to fight against those pests and to see how we could combine them. So just roughly, we have push, pull, pull, barrier lever, bottom-up processes mediated. So the plant top-down processes mediated by naturally occurring natural enemies or pests diversion of commensal uh, uh, organisms and direct measure with staff practices, including inoculative release. Okay, so this conceptual framework is, uh, we are still working on. This is the basis to uh, gather the knowledge we are uh, developing and uh, gathering within the frame of the project. And it will be also simplified and be used to help the co-design activity this co-design activity, which is meant to work together with the stakeholders, including farmers and advisors, and to help them to be aware that there are different types of lovers and that they interact together, and that the best way to define a strategy is to combine them together. Um, here the map of the shared experiments. So in work package three, where we work on knowledge enhancement, we work on single pest and on single lever or combinations of levers. And those are always multi-site experiments. All the lever, all the six lever, here the three is missing, but it's the common experiment. All the six levers are uh, worked and shared by at least two partners in order to work in different contexts and also to compare the outcome of it and to uh, generalize the results we become. So this map is also on the booklet. And finally, uh, we have also a common experiment. Uh, this is interesting because it is a cross question we all have. It is linked to the level three, bottom-up processes mediated by the plants. It's the effect of uh, growth status, which is the vigor of the tree, and the aphid return flight. So this protocol is shared by all the partner. All five countries are working on it. And the idea is uh, first to work together, which is important, so to create something together. And then also to uh, see if there is uh, some link. Uh, so if we can answer this uh, question, is there an effect of growth status, which can be correlated to uh, end nutrition, to the um, uh, vegetera uh, vegetal uh, material, uh, to the material we have. So the vigor is linked to uh, the trees and the cultivar we choose, and the way we are um, uh, structuring the tree, shaping the tree. So I'm not going for the first year just to, to say that's the result I can show you. 
In each country, we didn't find any correlation between these aspects, but uh, we think we need to go deeper into the results. That, uh, so we will repeat this experiment. So about design and co-design activity. So the first one is really linked to just to us, to the partner of the project. The idea is um, to encourage the people not only to uh, work on those lovers, but to already have in mind that it should be implemented within a whole production strategy. <laughs> And uh, so when they work on their levers, they really have to think to this conceptual framework again and to see how they could implement and integrate it with the other levers, what type of interaction could exist. This is also a permit within the frame of the project since most of the experiments are conducted either on station but on real orchard or on farm directly with farmers. So the levers has to be integrated within the farmer strategy. About co-design workshops, so we lead one, we, we organize one, the first uh, kickoff meeting, just to sensibilize the partner to the methodology. So how it is uh, to uh, do such a workshop. Uh, the idea was to design a sustainable orchard. Uh, and we organized several vo workshops, so in Sweden and in France, with farmers and researchers and other stakeholders, such as uh, uh, advisors, um, also um, a nurseries providing the plant material in order to define uh, or to answer to a specific question. In Sweden, it was how can I improve the uh, biodiversity within the orchard and improve the biological control? And that was a demand uh, by one farmer. So the objective of such a um, such a uh, workshop is to involve stakeholders to sensibilize farmers and advisors to the integrated approach, to already discuss with them the solution we have in mind and to see how they react. So it's also for us a nice source of information on how, what they think about those levers and solutions. And also to go to an integrated solution, again, to avoid this uh, typical uh, where we have of working to, to be, we have a problem, what is the solution? Really to go to an integrated approach. Uh, about work package three, and I think I have to uh, speed up a bit. It's fine? Okay. <laughs> um, it's um, in French, I would say, it's a list à la prévère. So it's the list of uh, different levers we are testing just to understand the processes behind that, how it works and to get some information also on the costs, the feasibility of those levers, how we could implement them within the strategy. So I'm back on the conceptual framework. Since we are uh, really for each type of lever, we will uh, test different solutions. So for this uh, first two levers, push-pull, barrier, dilution, we work on susceptible cultivar as a trap plant. Uh, we can work with uh, apple trees that are susceptible to rosy apple aphid, but where those uh, aphid can't develop. And we see if it works to have them as a barrier around the orchard. We could also work on companion plants, such as repellent aromatic plants. Uh, which are tested. Uh, we work uh, also on plant volatile emissions and their effects on uh, natural emissions, as well on the uh, selection of essential oils uh, against sawfly, in particular for those one. And we test also on the different type of diffuser to see if some are better or more interesting, easy to apply, and to to uh, yeah to place within the orchard. So. And what I'm uh, saying now is uh, available for all the type of levers we are working in Work Package 3. The levers will be assessed for their efficacy to act as push, pull, or barrier, and on feasibility and cost, and that's in close relation with Work Package 4 on uh, sustainability assessments. <coughs> about the bottom effect mediated by the plan, so we have uh, talked a bit about the common experiments which it share, but we will go into detail for certain aspects. So we are looking more in detail to entry nutrition and the effect on aphid infestation. 
Uh, some colleagues from Spain, Spain are working also on bird phenology and uh, how it has affect the blossom weevil attacks and the parasitism rate. And we work also, uh, still uh, our Spanish colleague, on the effect of cropping system. So the woodstock, the fertilization, and the weed management together, how it affects uh, aphids and their, uh, art, uh, by using artificial infestation as well as the natural enemies. Concerning the top-down processes mediated by natural enemies, we are working on agroecological infrastructure to encourage natural enemy by providing reservoir area, pesticide-free area, or uh, by providing food. Uh, just here, because this is really nice, the picture is not big enough, but this uh, blue tit is feeding rosy apple aphid, he has the most full of it. So that's, um, uh, so we work also on this type of predation, so not only on insects. Uh, the idea is to study the effect on the arthropod community and their dispersal, so the whole arthropod community, the pests and their natural enemies. There are some st specific work on pest suppression estimated by using sentinel preys, as well as on the identification of key predators by uh, analyzing good content of uh, generalist predators. On the uh, last two levers, five and six, that's about direct soft solution. So we are working on the diversion of ants because the ants are really the one maintaining the aphid and also helping them to uh, develop within the tree can canopy. Uh, that's our colleague from Sweden. They work with uh, alternative prey or sugar bait as well as disruptive formulations. And we work on different type of releases, augmentative and inoculative of predators and parasitoids against different, uh, different pests. Uh, just something to say, maybe uh, one example, we work also with earwig. Earwig is, um, is a pest in peach production, but it in, it's interesting for apple production since it's a generalist predator. So usually when we have orchards that are close to one another, we try to catch the uh, earwigs in the peach orchard to bring them to the apple orchard. So. So uh, to conclude with the uh, last work package on sustainability assessment, I will be really brief. This work package uh, did not really start yet since we need data to do the assessment. Uh, what we plan to evaluate is the agronomic performances of the integrated solutions, the feasibility for each lever as well as the cost of the proposed lever, single levers and combinations of levers. And for the uh, global sustainability assessment, we are going to use the tool uh, Dexy Fruit. Uh, we are now working on the tool adaptation. Dexy Fruits is a French tool we have developed for farmers and st stakeholders. It is dedicated to sustainability assessment. We use it as a diagnosis tool uh, to identify, here it's uh, not clear, but in red, what is not working and uh, in green what is working, really to, uh, on the three pillars of the sustainability. So since it was developed within the French context, we need to see how to uh, enlarge it to the, that it is operational also in other European context. So uh, just to conclude my speech, some words about dissemination activity. We have for now just a web page uh, for uh, in each uh, institution talking about the project and we are also working with the farmers that we are who are involved in the project are also uh, sensibilized to the project we are thinking to um, organize some larger workshop and here are some words on the final outcomes of the project so the idea is to get results on knowledge on ecological processes in orchards <laughs> to identify combinations of levers which can be implemented in different contexts with an extended application of Dexifruit tools to assess the Apple system performances and sustainability. 
and uh, really to think to the design of orchard systems allowing for the natural control of the main insect pest in a range of contexts. Something that we are uh, trying to uh, really make work in the project is uh, knowledge sharing and interaction among scientists and stakeholders. Uh, we are trying to involve, uh, whenever it is possible, the farmers and the advisors in the experimentation, but also thanks to those co-design workshops. And um, yeah, just to say that uh, we are really uh, paying attention to sensibilize all our partners to, uh, it is important to work on a solution for a single problem, but just think from the beginning on how to integrate this solution on a whole integrated uh, pest management strategy. So with that, I'm done. I will thank you for your attention, and if you have questions, please feel free. So we have five minutes for questions. Hi, thanks Hi. for your talk. Um, you were talking about trap plants that you're planning to, uh, to, to plant around the, the resistant varieties and the trap plants that are susceptible ones, that's right? Yep. Isn't it a risk uh, that you increase the population very, very strongly that uh, yeah, the pest pressure gets too high also for the resistant varieties? So we have um, so susceptible uh, cultivar, which is called Florina. It is susceptible to aphid, but so the aphid really love them when they come back. So the aphid, the rosy apple aphid, have just only half of its cycle on uh, apple tree. So it come back in autumn to stay till spring and then disappear. And when it come back in autumn, it really love this cultivar, but is not able in spring to develop on it. So it's really a trap. He loves it. It is, in a way, attractive. But uh, the way we, so we, we, have, we are working in two different ways, but this uh, plant is always, this cultivar is always mixed with other cultivar. And uh, so the idea is more that the aphids, well, they will return, because anyway, they come back. Uh, well, they will, uh, when they will return, they will not go to the other cultivar, but will be on this one, and then they will not develop. So we also try to uh, integrate, to plant those cultivars in the way <coughs> and to conduct them, to shape them in a way that they are not in contact with the other um, apple tree. So to avoid this dispersal. So it's really a trap. Can you harvest anything from, um, from the trap plants? Yeah, we hope so. So they were planted, uh, uh, some, they are too, too young to be productive yet. But yes, uh, it's supposed to be so since the development of the infestation of aphid is in spring. Uh, it's just at the flowering period. And since they are not so capable of developing on, those culti on this cultivar, they will not damage the fruit production. So we will, of course, follow that to be sure it works. Will you also look to the economic uh, aspects of this measure? Um, yes, we will look, but then uh, it's really complicated. I think uh, most of you, you know, the yellow apple and the red apple, you are eating golden gala, those two varieties which are the most susceptible variety. Uh, and this one, this Florina, is not responding to this standard. It's a really early apple that you are getting in August. And uh, that's uh, something that's the type of apple you are not uh, buying at the supermarket. So, of course, to replace some uh, plants of golden by those uh, is, uh, has a cost, has a consequence, yes. Hello, my name is Gabriele Christensen, and I'm probably the only not scientist in the room. But as I have a very general question, I'm a process-based lobbyist, and the principle of integrated pest management you can read up there. One of the principles in the definition of the Sustainable Use Directive is ecological practices. So my question is very simple. Why did you say in the beginning that your project was not IPM? 
it's, it's not that it's not IPM, it's that it's integrated fruit production. So we are, we are integrated IPM, but I'm not talking about IPM within this, since it's just, um, it just for, for us in fruit production, it's, let's say, natural. <laughs> uh, one of the lever we are using is mediated by the plants, so it's linked to cultural practices, not really to what we call plant protection practices. But those cultural practices have incidence on the plant protection strategy, on the pest development, and thus on the plant protection strategy. So the idea is really uh, to go over this IPM. It is integrated anyway, to think in this way, but to go further and to really think already in integrated food production systems. And that's the other aspect, the other reason for that is also that um, some of the levers might interfere with other cultural practices. If you, um, if you sow in the alley flower strips, you have to think to how you let it grow and how you will walk within your orchard with these flower strips. Those, so these flower strips, which is linked to IPM, will interfere with activities that are not linked to IPM. But to make it work and to make it efficient, you have to think to the whole production strategy, to the integrated food production strategy, to make it work. That's why I just it's not to think to IPM, it's to go really to integrated food production strategy into the world strategy, not only to, um, yeah, to, to, to stay on plant protection aspects. Thank you. Last question. We had one here. Thank you, Thank you Odex. Very uh, comprehensive work. Uh, did I miss uh, that you have not mentioned any disease problems? Yes. <laughs> no, you didn't miss anything. We focus on the apple pest complex. Yeah, we are missing all the disease. Um, so... Yeah, it was just a matter of um, yeah capacity of uh, of things. So we have two really, really two main uh, important diseases, which is scab and powdery mildew. Scab you can work with the plant material, that's one aspect. And uh, for uh, those two diseases, uh, sanitation practices are uh, really interesting. And you can have interesting solution, organic strategy, organic production strategies that are efficient. So we just decide to focus on the pest complex, which is not the whole pest complex, to define the strategy. And it's just also a matter of uh, opportunity and consor consortium uh, uh, partners that we've got. But we missed that. <laughs> okay, so um, we still have two minutes left if you have any question uh, about the three projects and then uh, it's time for the coffee break. It's also a question for Aude. Thank you very much for your presentation. I was wondering uh, if you are taking into account and how you do it, uh, the differences in uh, management that you have across Europe. Because like you mentioned, for example, like Golden and uh, and I don't remember which one, like <laughs> and Gala. Yeah, this is, it's actually species, like varieties that we, I don't think we actually grow them in Sweden. Yeah, so, and I guess like so all the management strategies are pretty different in different countries. And I'm just wondering how does that, um, like is that uh, taken into account in your project? Um, so, thank you for the question. I really uh, easily put the emphasis in the range of contexts, focusing on pedoclimatic contexts. But it's of course not the only things that are varying among the uh, different partners and countries. Um, there are a lot of things that are uh, diverse. Uh, you are speaking about the cultivars varieties we are using and uh, the plant protection strategy is really different from one country to the other. I was uh, t uh, talking about the use of neem oil, for instance, or neem azal, which is allowed in certain country in other not. Among the partners, there are differences also. Uh, we, are not, we are most of us working on organic uh, strategy, but not all of us. We are also... Uh, open to other type of uh, production strategy. Uh, and um, 
we are uh, yeah we are also having a, a big difference in the orchard infrastructure so the point is really to integrate those variety and to when we describe the level we describe also the production strategy behind that to again to try to describe and to identify the interactions we have and um, that's also why we try uh, the, the map I show with the uh, different levers. We also try to test each lever at least in two sites to get also information from these variations, which are huge. So hopefully we get something. It might also make some difficulties to, to conclude on specific levers, for sure. So that's positive and uh, complex. <laughs> Thank you. So now it's time for the coffee break. So let's thank again the three presentation, the three speakers for them. Nice. Work. Thank you. So it's half a minute break. Half an hour, sorry. <laughs>